Brain, Issue 17. It starts out in Transylvania, and for some reason, Pinky thinks Brain did a silly dance as an experiment when it was really just Pinky's suggestion for Oktoberfest. This would only make sense if he was joking. Somehow, they have a castle to themselves. They must have time-traveled to an unoccupied castle. And instead of the story being creative, Brain's trying to make a Frankenstein, and he wants to make an army. Pinky looks like he's got a hump, and fortunately doesn't look like that for the whole story. And he was just fooling around wearing his backpack under his lab coat again. Apparently lab coats come in black now. But Brain's not the type to try to look cool unless it's for a world domination plan. Brain tells him to move the brain in a preservation jar to the insertion device that'll put it into the skull. And he says that if the jar's special solution got spilled, months of work would be lost. Since all Brain's planning to do is scrub up the facilities, there's no reason he need to trust Pinky with this valuable task of putting the brain under the device. Pinky has an amusing quip calling the brain Brain and asks him what he wants to do. Then Snowball shows up imitating him, and he's vampires called by a different name. So this is a different universe. Why is Snowball telling him his plan instead of doing it before he'd stop him? He should interrupt him. Pinky's horrified at what he does. Eventually, Pinky ends up in the jar, tied up and muffled. And Snowball flies away with the brain in the jar in a finger. He's only a vampire to cause the plot to happen. Because otherwise, he couldn't have flown away. But it's not forced, because if a magic book and wand could exist for Pinky earlier, then witches could have been the one who made these three in this dimension. And at that point, they could have made one a vampire for fun. But that'd be insanely irresponsible, so why would it be allowed? They'd have nothing to gain from making them. Brain gets freaked out as soon as the Frankenstein talks like Pinky. And for no reason, Pinky refers to himself in the third person and uses bad grammar just because he was put in this body. And he damages the lab a lot. And Brain tells him to stop talking in the third person. And thankfully, he does so. So Pinky wasn't forced to talk like that. He was just having fun with being trapped in this body. He was deliberately referencing Frankenstein. Again, it only makes sense if he said this line sarcastically. Maybe a twister took me over the rainbow to a strange and enchanted land. So Brain wants to try to get the brain back. I like that that's original, but what's not is the fact that people get scared of seeing Frankenstein, who he'd have to make the skin of green on purpose. A cop says he's never seen these two before and wants them to state their business. Pinky tells him the truth. I guess Brain is hoping the cop doesn't believe him after he lies that they're just out for a stroll. Finally, the cop asks why Pinky's so funny looking. Brain lies that he's a rugby player, and it's a rough sport, and the English weather affects one's complexion. There's no reason for him to believe that. He just pretends to because obviously he'd never get the real answer. Brain tells him what he really is and doesn't get taken seriously because he's so small. So the cop warns them to stay clear of the picnic, because he doesn't want old people to lose their lunch over seeing Brain. Then it cuts to them standing in front of Snowball's castle. It's so convenient that there's two mostly abandoned castles in the same small area. No royalty in either of them. Pinky pushes open the door, damaging it, and apologizes to Brain for making so much noise creaking on the stairs. When he can't help it. They find the container, which has Snowball jump out, and Pinky jumps and grabs the chandelier, which falls down. Snowball says he wants to get his own show on the newly invented TV hosting old monster movies and hypnotize the world with his vampire powers. And every horror movie needs a silly puppet sidekick, apparently. Since when? He's crazy. So he's going to use the brain and some other thing that's hanging from ropes, which he named after Pinky and Brain. So Brain screams because it'd be humiliating. It looks nothing like Pinky. And Snowball would only have a chance at getting on TV because it's a talking hamster. Brain briefly tries to stop him, and Pinky says that Snowball has a bug and spider petting zoo that he's going through the trouble of taking care of. Does he want to use them against his enemies? I guess they're not old enough to be used against Brain. Pinky slips and crashes through the wall, and Snowball says he has to flee because of the sunlight. 
It sure is convenient for him that it doesn't instantly kill him, like it did Dracula, just because the kids is comic. So he says they'll meet again, even though you'd think you'd have no choice but to run back into the castle, and not have the time to run around trying to find another building to hide in. And he could easily be chased and prevented from doing so. I guess Brain doesn't want him dead, so that's why he's letting him go. But you'd think he would still follow him and continue their fight. I guess Pinky and Brain are just that exhausted. You'd think Snowball would be smart enough as a mad scientist to make himself immune to the sunlight. Make a anti-sunlight lotion. And after I didn't think it would happen, the old people at the picnic see Pinky and Brain anyways. The Frankenstein gets thrown so far down that Pinky ends up jumping out of it. Predictably, his brain solution was ruined. They're forced to run from the police for scaring people, as if the cops would believe them that talking mice showed up. As if it's the job of the police to run after mice. But the story ends with them holding an invisibility formula. I assume he got it from Snowball. You know, once that guarantee he'd take over the world. I mean, aside from the fact that he's so small that he'd still be easily dealt with. In the next story, Pinky rides around on a little bike that must have been specially built for him by Brain as a gift because it's so small. He gets talked to, but the text bubble looks unusual and says, I, your best friend, the Brain. When Pinky asks why he's speaking in such a morose way, he says, well, uh, You'd be dismal too if you were stuck in this drawer. That doesn't explain why he's talking like a ghost trying to haunt him, which would only make sense if he was trying to scare him for fun, and that's something his enemy would do. Why would he try to scare him for fun and expect them to let him out? He gets apologized to and eventually opens the drawer, and releases a giant monster that floats. It's magical enough to float, but it doesn't have the magic to free itself from a drawer instantly. Also, the drawer must have the ability to shrink anything in it and keep it that way as long as it's fully trapped inside. As I expected, there's no excuse for Pinky thinking that was Brain then, because he would have immediately known that it wasn't his voice or anywhere close to it. Unless the demon has the ability to perfectly imitate Brain's voice. Brain shows up and surprisingly, he vacuums up the ghost instantly. Good, I thought it was going to be a problem for the whole story. He says it's a particle collector, and when Pinky hopes he's still gonna collect Beanie Babies, he says not tonight. So either he's humoring him, or actually is going to. It's interesting. He says that at the right time, when the spirit he's been saving is at Zenith, a spirit that he was lucky even bound, he'll vaporize it in a chamber, reducing it to billions of particles of evil. Once spread across the globe, they'll scare everyone in the world, making them too distracted with cowardice to stop him from taking it over. He plans on getting their attention after they're not scared anymore, right? He assumes that it's temporary? What difference does it make if he's sitting in the president's chair if everyone's too scared to pay attention to him, to carry out his orders? That would apply to everyone having itching powder over them, too, or laughing uncontrollably. He tells Tanky to point that device's nozzle, and Piggy gets shocked by it for no reason, so he gets turned into a scary monster. It's brave of Brain to defend his mother when he insults her despite looking scared. Especially since in the show, she did nothing but nag him, so he didn't even like her. Brain says Pinky has been possessed by that spirit. That doesn't explain why he looks different. I thought he was transformed completely. So the demon can change someone's appearance, so why wouldn't the demon outright make him look like himself? Because he'd prefer the way he looks. He wants to get him to an exorcist, instead of lying to him about where he wants to take him to get him to go there willingly. It's not like he's too scared to think to lie to him, because he's brave enough to grab him by the nose because he joked around with him like Pinky would. Pinky dribbles him like a basketball and throws him into a coffee cup. I think I'm enjoying seeing Pinky get back at Brain, even if he's not himself right now. And of course, his super healing factor is the only explanation for why he survives being turned into a basketball. It cuts ahead in time to Pinky tied to the bed by all fours, and he says he should have known Brain wasn't the goth bracelet salesman. And he says, we should have known. So Pinky's still in there, but he's happy with the situation? He's too possessed to mind? 
he's hungry, uses something he's holding to spray him with cheese, and he's strong enough to make the bed bounce and crush him. He breaks free of the ropes. Then Brain remembers that he's fine with hurting Pinky, so he tries to hit him with a hammer a lot, even after he threatens him with a chainsaw. Brain throws him in the ghost vaporizer and says he thinks Pinky's gone. He sure is being brave and taking it well, because I'd expect him to be sad, not serious, when saying that. Then he's shown the real Pinky passed out and goes into denial and asks if he's a trick and not the real Pinky. He says if he opens the door, the monster would escape, so he has no choice but to vaporize them for the good of the world. He looks serious and says he has to do this at the right time to take over the world. Pinky pleads for his life, and Varian explains that he plans on cloning a new Pinky from one of its particles. So that explains it even better. Pinky wonders if his clone won't be enough like him. It would be. But smart events make him think this. Brain stutters and apologizes, and of course he couldn't do it. That was a shocking scene, but it was worth it to remind us how much he cares about Pinky. He opens the door, and Pink ends up out of there with no hard feelings towards him. But the story ends with Brain being possessed instead, and that'll never be resolved, so poor Pinky. I guess both these stories take place in separate universes from all the others. Pinky and the Brain, Issue 18 It starts out in a futuristic city with a square text bubble saying it was the year that everything changed. If it's just Pinky talking and he's not a robot, why are his text bubble squares if he's a robot? Also, why are the characters drawn in obviously bad anime art style for no reason? That's embarrassing. But for these characters, because they're not humans, it's not as bad as it could be. It's already distracting that Brain has a stupid mustache and red nose for no reason. Which made me more interested in ranting about the art than the dialogue. Pinky says he's making up his memoirs because celebrities do it. So while he's wasting his time writing a diary, Brain warns him that an unknown, dangerous spaceship entered Earth's orbit, and he wonders if Pinky heard the alarm. Pinky apologizes and says that he thought he was playing a Simon game again. Brain says that he developed his battle technology with parts from a convenient, crashed UFO to take over the world, and he activates it to try to save the world instead. So Acme Labs rockets into the air, and since Pinky's narration just states the obvious and wastes a lot of time boring me, I'm glad Brain tells him to cut it out. Pinky apologizes, and Brain tells a robot servant to take them into orbit. There's no reason he'd make it based on a Tamagotchi, which is the reason it nags him. Pinky glares at him uncharacteristically for his dumb idea, and expects me to believe that it was either him or a beeper. Or he could have simply built it from scratch. Why would he choose this over the beeper? Brain flies the lab towards what looks like the Death Star, but he calls it a hamster ball. Snowball contacts Brain over a video phone, and Snowball's a space pirate in this universe. It must be a pop culture reference. So it's yet another time I'm glad I'm not familiar with the plot it's referencing, because I'd be very bored. Why can't the comic be like the earlier seasons and come up with their own ideas? Or at least seem to. Snowball says that he used convenient crash UFO technology too. He blasts Snowball's spaceship, but it's immune because of a force field. Brain says what the weak spot of his own ship is while trying to figure out what Snowball's ship is weak to when he already knows what it is. And Snowball hears this because he wasn't hung up on after he called them. And Peggy says it's not polite to hang up on someone as an explanation for that, since his instinct is to be polite. But the screen's right in front of Brain's eyes. So why did he think the comm link wasn't open? He had no reason to assume he was hung up on. Then Brain blasts at the weak spot of Snowball's spaceship because he got lucky. Since both of the spaceships are too damaged, Brain decides to go somewhere else in his ship and use his armored battle units, which would make it easy for him to storm the White House and take it over. After assuming he's too impatient to make these things himself because it take too long, so he never has them because the UFO has to crash first. They leave Tamagotchi alone, still hungry. That's been referenced a lot. I wonder if that'll backfire on them. The boring narration comes back as an entire page is wasted, 
We see them in their suits anyway. It's in the next page. Why have that one? Pinky asks Brain to check to see if he left his rear hatch in it open. He doesn't check, but maybe he should because it'll leave a weak spot exposed. Then Snowball goes after them in a flying suit too. Why is Pinky thinking about Daunt? He never met her. If he did, she's not much of a presence in his life. And why is it a text bubble and not a thought bubble? Brain and Pinky fly past each other. And it's amusing that they both lied that they meant to do that. I, uh, meant to do that. And I was testing you! Pinky flies in a snowball spaceship because he doesn't know how to stop his flying suit. And the spaceship's falling towards the city. Pinky says people could get killed and wants to prevent that from happening. He pushes against it and uses his retro rockets to try to steer it to the left. And slow down its fall by pushing it and flying into it. Because otherwise, if he didn't slow his fall to a crawl before it land, its landing would still cause considerable damage. It stays in the sky because of where he turned it. And I have no reason to care about Brain's fight because I'm just seeing a bunch of smoke in front of him as he shoots at him. And there's no sign of the two getting their suits progressively more damaged. There's no satisfying impacts. We don't get to see their fists collide with each other. So their fight is just a bunch of nothing. Snowball's suit is unharmed, and Brain sacrifices his dignity by wasting time trying to take back his insult to them, and gets smacked to the ground, where he references that Tokyo gets attacked by giant lizards in the future. Sure, why not? It's the future. Pink ends up smacking into a tall building, and that causes it to crumble and fall into some other buildings, knocking them over like dominoes. Well, that's too dark. Sure, it's convenient that nobody ever references the big trouble they cause. Brain's lion tried to add some levity to this, though. Of course, giant lizards and earthquakes have nothing on Pinky. Brain threatens Snowball's suit with a giant Swiss army knife, just to aim a ray of sunlight at the bottom of his suit with a magnifying glass from it. That he somehow thought to include in a Swiss army knife. Just in case he'd be faced with something immune to weapons, apparently. Sure, it's a shame for Snowball that he didn't think to make his rear deflectors resist heat more. So why didn't Brain think to do this earlier? There's no reason he'd tell Snowball how to cool himself right now. Snowball sits on a comet, and he talks as if this means it's the end of their fight. Brain assumes that he won't see him again for a really long time, because the comet travels so fast. What makes him think he wouldn't come back a lot sooner after making a spaceship from the comet's materials? Brain complains that Tamagotchi is bringing the Acme lab to him too fast. And Peggy says he didn't remember to feed him. So of course he gets back at them for it, after being absent from the story so long they stopped thinking about him. The lab crashes, destroying all of Brain's brain tech devices. In the next story, it takes place in ancient Japan, where Pinky and Brain are tired from walking miles across the field, with Pinky carrying a crate. There's no reason Brain would think that he couldn't take over the world without becoming a master of martial arts. And there's no reason he'd think that he could be taught to be one without downloading the information that a teacher would know into a robot the same size as him first. Because any normal teacher would be too tall for him to defend against, so he wouldn't get the chance to really fight and improve. He'd know these obvious problems, so why would he consider entering a martial arts competition? He wants to win a chain of dojos to send thousands of fighters to fight on his behalf. I guess he's too impatient to make a robot army which could do the job just as well. It worked for Robotnik and Sadie M and Archie. Not to mention he could have a flying robot carry that crate for Pinky. Why does he still have those stupid eyebrows and mustache? It's not like him to have a plan to take over the world that involves violence, as in from the students. So then why doesn't he try it more often? He brings Pinky to a field full of cursed pools that are too small for me to take them seriously. There's a sign saying, Pool of the Drowned Long Distance Salesperson. So at least the story is still trying to be funny to make up for Brain's ridiculous appearance. I assume they'll only look bad for this one issue. Or at least it's only a thing for the stories that rip off Japanese stories. Brain warns Pinky that if he falls in a pond here, he'll take on the characteristics of whichever poor soul drowned in there. It's compassionate of him to say, poor soul. But it's so confusing that nobody thought to cover up these pools then. And how does anyone know that someone drowned in a pool here if there's no one around? 
Someone has to find out every time, or there wouldn't be those signs. And how does that person know what everyone who drowned is like, so that it could write on the sign? Maybe he drowned them. If you saw that person fall in the pool, why didn't he pull him out of it otherwise? He must not have faith in himself to be strong enough to carry someone out of a pool. Or he can't swim. Or he's evil. If he makes it his job to spy on this place all day just to see if someone would fall into a pool to put a sign up about it. And of course, the only reason these magical pools would exist would be that spiteful witches made them. Pinky has embarrassingly stilted dialogue, and Brain tells him to cool it with the theatrics. Which shows that the writer's aware of it, but doesn't make up for it. Brain says he took the bullet train most of the way here. Brain wants to jump into the cursed pool of the Master of Martial Arts, so he's hoping that pool exists? It makes sense that he'd have a hope for that with all of those signs. And there is such a pool, so he's smart after all, because this way it's actually believable that he could become an expert at karate. What a relief, I thought it'd be a boring story where he gets pummeled by a bunch of humans at karate class. Pinky compliments Brain, and I guess he thinks it'd be fun to become a Liza Minnelli impersonator, and that's why he wants that. There's a sign saying that warm liquid will deactivate the curse, and cold liquid will reactivate it. Why would this be the case when it'd only be the case if the creator of the curse willed it to be so for no reason? If someone's spiteful enough to make a curse, they wouldn't make it so that it could be undone, and especially not so easily. Why would a curse have to have a way out of it? Then Brain jumps into exactly the pool he wanted to find, but Pinky pushes aside the bush that Brain was too excited to push aside himself, just in case there was more to the sign. So Pinky finds out that Brain will get split personality disorder from this, but somehow he decides to jump into that pool right after he just got warned about this, when it should have been under the assumption that Brain jumped into the pool because he already learned how to swim. So why do you think Brain would need saving? I assumed immediately that the second you hit the water, you've been cursed. So it's obvious that he was too late to save him from the curse. What's especially confusing is that apparently Pinky's data gets trapped inside of Brain's brain, and he's able to communicate with Brain with telepathic messages. Why is the pool like this? Does this always happen when two people fall into the pool at once? Because anyone would assume that the result would be that both of them would leave the pool with a split personality disorder. This is creative, but it's also confusing that it happens just because the curse didn't account for an extra person. How could Pinky get trapped in Brain's head as a result of a glitch in the curse's programming? There won't be any room for him in there. I guess another part of the curse's glitchy reaction to a second person is that it created a little room in Brain's head with a poster of Gabrielle because it's a vivid memory of his. But that's so specific! How could that be a glitch? This is so confusing. And it could be the case so that rumors would spread about it to discourage anyone from trying to save someone who fell in. So that'd help explain why a person drowned in every pool. It doesn't need to be the case though, because the only reason someone would drown in any of these pools is if someone drowned them in one. Anyone would be able to see the pools coming while walking towards them. Only a toddler would be dumb enough to walk into a pool without the ability to swim, and none of these signs talk about those. So it's just a part of the curse of this one pool out of spite. Brain tells him to stop going through his things, and he's relatably off-put by this. If I were him, I'd at least try jumping into the pool again to see if that undoes the problem. Somehow, there's already someone entered in the Ultimate Martial Arts Challenge with the name of Future Ruler of the World. And the person with the modern style clipboard and suit says it's already been taken. Completely casually. Looking bored. Instead of commenting on how unlikely it was that two people tried that name. I wonder if Snowball is the one who took that name first. Because that makes sense. It cuts to some fighters in the cage and they're told that the last man standing wins. And go figure, Brain somehow makes the mistake of talking to Pinky in front of people when he'd know that'd make him look crazy. But it is wise of him to not care, because it doesn't really matter what they think of him for now. Seriously, it's so obvious Brain couldn't beat these guys in a fight because he's so short. So I'm looking forward to how he's gonna end up winning, because that'll take some creative effort to think up. If it's ripping off some other plots, then at least took creative effort for the original writer. 
Brain somehow thinks a true martial arts master is bold enough to lead off with a cocky, verbal brunch. He'd get interrupted with a punch. There's lots of times where he's scared when his life is in danger, so he wouldn't do this. I guess it only happens because he took on the characteristics of the martial arts master. A hot tea vendor removes his hand and accidentally spills some hot tea somehow. And it spills on Brain, and the hot water in the tea makes Brain and Pinky switch places. Why is nobody questioning how this happened? Won't someone think they're hallucinating? I guess they're rolling with it because they already think he's a magical being because he's a talking mouse. But it'd be believable if they reacted with surprise to him suddenly looking different and sounding different. I can only give the story the benefit of the doubt and assume they did react with surprise. But we didn't see it because of the meaningless backgrounds showing me nothing in those panels. How's there a paddle ball and dust in Pinky's head? So, the curse maker makes it so that the tiny room in a person's skull has stuff that reflects their personality. Just so that the person sent in there could react to it. And maybe that's to embarrass the person. Pinky runs away from the fighters and shurikens and compassionately says he's a lover, not a fighter. It's smart of him to do this, since there is no chance of either of them doing well in the fights by attacking anyone directly. Then someone orders an ice cold soda from another vendor. In ancient Japan. It sure is a different parallel universe. Anyways, the soda must have water in it, because how else did Soda return Brain to being the one in control of his body? I guess the fighters ran at Brain and he grabbed their fingers, so he used the momentum from their run against them. But after that, how did he not get carried away with that momentum and stay in one place instead? The only way Brain could be moving those huge fighters like this above his head just by grabbing their fingers when he's not stuck deep in the ground is if he got telekinesis. A mild form of telekinesis is the only way super strength could make sense without lifting the heavy object, injuring the person from its weight weighing down on him. It was already a magical pool that makes you take on the characteristics of a person, so for it to really work on a tiny mouse, it'd have to give him the strength of a human. I guess he's sliding forwards from this, but we don't see it because it's one panel. Pinky says, all those muscles in a mind too. You know Brain, you make quite a catch. And Brain tells him not to go there. Once again smart enough to immediately jump to that conclusion instead of just appreciating the compliment at face value. I always appreciate these kind of lines from Pinky. It's gutsy, it helps explain why he hasn't left him, and makes him happier being around him, the closest he'd ever have to a friend. Then someone just outside the big cage pours hot soup in a bowl for some dogs. This seems so unlikely. I could buy the other two instances, but how did this happen? How did it get splashed with liquid three times? Pinky runs from the ninjas dressed in their over-the-top, historically inaccurate ninja clothes, saying that he was about to take a nap on his comfy cranial lobe. If he can do that and he's not mistaking a piece of furniture summoned by the curse for that, that's too dark. Brain tells Pinky to go up. He jumps in between them afraid, and the ninjas punch each other by accident, which was always the way I assumed the brain would win the fight. All he'd have to do is take advantage of his small size to do this to all of them. Pinky tells Brain he tricked them and looks mad. That doesn't seem like him. Not that I don't appreciate him getting mad at Brain at all, because Brain deserves it and it's about time. It's relatable of him for once. He says he won't lift a finger to help him now, speaking out of character. It's good of him to be committed to non-violence, but it makes me wonder why he didn't speak out against Brain's plan to hire thousands of karate students to help him take over the world then. I guess he assumed he'd never get that far, which would justify him not caring. Some fighters glare at Pinky holding weapons. So why are weapons allowed in a martial arts fight anyways? That misses the point. You're not proving you're good at martial arts if you're using a weapon, and the fact that they're lethal weapons most of the time. That'd definitely be illegal. I guess they're gonna be disqualified and prosecuted later, but they should have expected that and not brought them. Why well, someone outside the cage splash the fighters with water? He says, here you go fellas, this'll help cool you down. Why does he think they'd want that? I assumed right away that he was doing this because he doesn't like them and he's on brain side. He sides with the mouse that's talking to himself out of sheer pity and interest. 
Since he stands out so much, it makes sense that he'd get supporters. Since Brain outright said what cool liquids do to him, and it was demonstrated, it's obvious that the audience and the fighters would take in this information, not be blind and deaf to it. So this guy cooling Pinky down with water makes perfect sense considering that. He cooled him down specifically to make him turn back into Brain, so he wouldn't get killed by all of those fighters ganging up on the little guy. Of course, some people would want to root for the underdog. Speaking of taking in the information, the only reason the fighters would be scared when Brain gets mad at them, even though he's so small, is that they learned from the fact that he took out two fighters. What are the chances that he'd get splashed with liquid again? Someone's walking around offering hot rice wine and spills some into the cage for no reason. It makes sense if he did this to Brain on purpose because he's rooting for one of the other fighters. There's already a tea vendor and a soda vendor. There sure are a lot of people in that audience that the artist was too lazy to draw. It doesn't create the constant impression that they're being watched by an audience if the background's always these boring yellow walls. And brain lampshades. Anyone ever tell you that you have the clumsiest vendors in the world here? He should know nobody outside of Pinky can hear him. He's just saying this to vents because he's used to people being able to hear him. The fighters fight each other because they want to be the one to beat Brain, because naturally, they'd rather take out the guy with super strength first while he's weak. Brain tells Pinky to climb into a water bucket over there, and Pinky makes the wise decision of trying to follow his advice instead of continuing to try to spite him because he's scared. He ends up spilling the water on himself, which gets Brain control of his body back. He wants to attack the fighter, and Pinky tells him to look out for that puddle that he'd be able to see because it's in front of him. So there's no reason he'd slip on it and fall out of the ring and lose the fight by ring out. He was drawn doing a flying kick. I have to assume he landed on the puddle the guy was standing in. The curse gets completely broken. And Pinky says there's nothing worse than cold, hot, and sour soup. And Brain says that the contradictory nature of the soup broke the curse. Huh? That seems creative. It must have been hard for someone to come up with that. But wouldn't it be a cold liquid? A liquid can't be both hot and cold. They'd never get back to normal. So we see them running away from dogs because they smell like soup. It's surprisingly nice that all the dogs do against them is lick them. The first story by Jesse McCann was about brain making a Frankenstein. Because it's so much faster to make an army that way. But because of Snowball, Pink ends up trapped in it, and the brain in a jar gets stolen. So after it imitates Frankenstein because people get scared of him, it's back to being original, with Pinky getting to his castle. Brain doesn't get to do anything to Snowball though. It's not like we see him hit him a lot. So it's a lot of build up to no payoff. Snowball's only there to steal his jar and get him to go somewhere, but what's the point of having him there at the end? if he's not going to get beaten up. Instead, Pinky breaks a hole in the wall letting sunlight in, and somehow Snowball survives this and thinks he'd survive running around outside looking for another building to hide in, instead of hiding in the castle. The only reason he even got away with the brain in the jar is because he's a flying vampire in this universe. The whole reason the plot happens, and that's not even explained, but it is one of the stories that makes the most sense in this comic. I just have to assume a witch created Pinky, Brain, and Snowball in this universe. But why? The second story by Jesse unfortunately tried to be scary by having Pinky get possessed by a demon that Brain had for no reason. Because a nozzle he was holding shocked him for no reason. I would have liked to see the story behind how he found that demon. So Pinky gets made to dribble a Brain like a basketball. If the story was all slapstick against Brain, this could have been entertaining, because we'd see Pinky get back at him for all the times he hurt him. But instead he gets tied to a bed, breaks free of the ropes, but then Brain gets to hit him with a hammer and doesn't even get hurt himself. Eventually there's a shocking scene where he tries to vaporize Pinky, even if he does provide a lot of explanations for why he thinks he has to do it. And he thankfully can't bring himself to him. It sucks that the story ends with them possessed, so we'll never know how they got out of that situation. I mostly just hate how the story has Pinky looks scary with his text bubbles looking different the whole time. It's off-putting. This might be the most off-putting story in the comic. 
The first story by Jesse McCann is drawn in a manga style, along with the next story. So the characters look distractingly worse. Good thing they were fighting Snowball and flying mecha suits for most of it that didn't make them look bad anymore. That's really all the plot was about. Brain basically does nothing against Snowball besides talk to him. Until eventually he beats him in a creative way because he thought to include a magnifying glass in the suit and burned Snowball with it. Pinky saved the city by preventing Snowball's spaceship from crashing into it. I hope that was enough to make up for all the trouble they caused in this comic. A fight between Brain and Snowball could be satisfying instead of a bunch of boring nothing. Because we could have seen Brain's fist impact him a lot. But it doesn't happen once. What's the point if they're just in mech suits so the slapstick isn't satisfying and funny? The second story by Jesse McCann is about Brain going to a field full of pawns that are cursed so that you take on the characteristics of the one who drowned in them. The story is too lazy to explain this. So I have to assume that a creative witch did it out of spite. And that it makes sense that those people drowned because they were drowned intentionally. Still, someone would have to make a deal with the drowners so that they'd use a different pool every time instead of them going with what's more convenient and using the pool closest to them every time. I wouldn't be surprised if this was based on some old Japanese fable because of the magical pools. Brain got lucky because one of the pools gave them super strength. But Pinky sees the rest of the sign behind a bush and somehow he decides to jump into the pool too when it'd obviously be too late to save him from the curse. So I'm especially confused when he gets shrunken and trapped in Brain's brain in a room with stuff in it somehow that'd have to be magically summoned there. Because obviously there'd be no room for him. But it's so confusing that this happens because there was no foreshadowing. I thought Pinky would just get a split personality as well as Brain, and they'd stay separate. Of course, I'm glad this happened instead, because it's a lot more interesting. Brain keeps having trouble in the fight against martial artists in an attempt to win some dojos. But as I expected, he beats the fighters around him because they end up attacking each other, while Pinky has the compassion to run away the whole time. That was smarter than risking getting hurt trying to fight when he's that smaller than them. It didn't strike me as believable that Brain and Pinky got splashed by most of those liquids by accident from people spilling on them. How are they so clumsy? This would have to be their first day on the job. And Brain would have seen the puddle in front of him. So he wouldn't slip and fall out of the ring. At least this was an especially interesting plot. But it kept being confusing. Instead of trying to get martial arts students under his authority, Brain could have just made a robot army and avoided its plot. So I have to assume he thought it'd take too long. The plot's where he simply tries to make an army take over the world in some fashion. Or easily his best plans, so they're the most likely to succeed. Because they keep it simple. 